The Unshackled Waves, Episode 75. Hello and welcome to the Unshackled Waves podcast. I'm Tim Wilms, back for another interview show. And we are lucky to have as our guest uh, for this week, uh, video producer Topher Field. He's a professional video producer. He's assisted in producing some of those fabulous Friedman Conference videos that you may have seen online. He's probably been in the Liberty Movement for as long as I have. Uh, And he also uses his uh, video talents to uh, produce Liberty Education videos, which are available on his YouTube channel and Facebook page. Uh, His latest web series is called Lifestyle Regulation Madness, and he's also just started a new web series called The Pub Test. Uh, Most of his videos are much more professionally produced than those that we have on The Unshackled, and he's also been a regular speaker at various uh, Liberty events that I've attended over the years, so I thought I'd invite Topher on to discuss his latest projects and well as discuss how to better promote Liberty. So Topher, welcome to the show. Tim, thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. Now, I'll start with, um, because, yeah, we're both libertarians, so I'm curious to know Mm. what your journey to libertarianism was. So uh, how did did you arrive at it? Yeah, I I guess I should start that by sort of talking a bit about what I was before I was a libertarian. And, And that would be very much a classic conservative. I, growing up and certainly well into my teenage years, I was what you would describe as a pretty much a cookie cutter, two dimensional conservative. Uh, Everything that John Howard did was amazing. Everything that any other political party did was terrible. Um, I supported all the wars that that we went into. I supported the gun ban when it came out. I supported the baby bonus. I supported all of those um, good, solid conservative initiatives. And what's changed for me over the years isn't so much what I think for myself or the decisions that I would make in terms of what I would do in my own life. But what's really changed for me is the realization that no one should have the power to force other people to live their lives according to our particular point of view. So I really haven't changed a lot in terms of what I choose to do, um, but I've changed radically in terms of what I would use the government to do and what I think would be appropriate there. And that I think was just a journey where you inevitably, as you get older, you start to see more and more that, that theory and reality don't often line up. And we joke a lot about this for people who are more on, I guess, the left wing or the, the more um, progressive side of politics. And, and there's the old, excuse me, there's the old joke about um, if you're not a liberal, an American version, you know, left wing, uh, when, you're, when you're young, then you have no heart. But if you're not a conservative, when you're older, then you have no head. And there's, there's kind of there's these jokes that get made uh, around the progress that people make as they gain life experience and as they see more of life. But I think for me, even though I started on the conservative end of the spectrum, there was still just that recognition that none of these policies had quite the outcome that the politicians thought they were going to have. Uh, So many unintended consequences, so many things would occur that were not foreseen or anticipated by the policymakers, so many inefficiencies about the way governments were using our money and what they were doing. And then ultimately, eventually, I came to the point where I realised, regardless of effectiveness, regardless of utility, there comes a point where you have to say, actually, you have no right. Even if even if the policy that you're pushing would actually work, it's actually irrelevant because you have no right. And it, it took me some years to get to that point. So now I, I would describe myself very much as personally conservative, but politically very much libertarian. And I, I think the government on, on both sides of the political spectrum, the government is being used by, by adherents to each end of the spectrum to try and force their view onto other people. And that's where I draw the line and just say, no, you're free to make whatever choices you want to make for yourself. If you ask me for my opinion, I will give you a very conservative opinion. If you're asking me what I personally think would be a wise decision in any given situation, it's likely to be a very conservative response. But when it comes to government, the use of power, the writing of laws, Uh, taxation, etc. Very much a libertarian view that you should be allowed to make your decisions, uh, including your own mistakes, 
and I should be allowed to make my decisions, including my own mistakes, uh, and we should each then suffer the consequences or the, the, the profits, the benefits of the decisions that we make and the lives that we choose to lead. So I haven't changed, but my politics has definitely, definitely changed a lot over the years. Uh, it sounds like you started off with what's called the 3 by 5 index card of allowable opinion, that you're either a, a lefty, liberal or a conservative and there's nothing in between. And so, so sort of people, people like us, we, we've explored a bit more and found, hey, there, there's this mm. new philosophy out there, or well, not new philosophy, but uh, we've discovered it. For the first yeah, time but new for us. Yes. Yeah. But I think that what you're talking about there, Tim, is, is what's happening with a lot of younger people um, where they are discovering that there is more to the spectrum than just the left or the right. Uh, and I think actually we're, we're looking at a new generation coming in that, that have kind of innately in them a desire to be left alone and a desire to be free to make their own choices. I was quite downcast for quite some time uh, in my sort of early 20s as I was beginning my own personal change. I was quite downcast about the thought that, oh, no, the Greens are going to win politically because they have all the young people. And inevitably, as the older people, the conservatives die out and the, the, the younger people, you know, become more and more of voting age, then inevitably politics is going to move further and further to the left. And what I've realised since then is two things. Number one, people grow up and their politics changes as they grow up. Uh, and number two, actually, if you look beyond sort of the Gen Xs into the into your Gen Ys and certainly into your, your millennials, there is a much stronger attitude of live and let live. Now, that's not universal. There's plenty of exceptions. But I think if you were to look at the percentages across the demographic, um, certainly from my very imperfect sampling of the people that, that I know, I think you'll find that we're actually looking at in, in the millennials, we're seeing a generation of people that actually just want to be left alone and are much more willing to leave other people alone as well. Well, so I, I think the the demographics I think are moving in our favour at least um, as we head into the next generation. Oh, we certainly hope uh, that's the case. So we've talked about your journey to libertarianism. What uh, turned you from libertarianism into being such a passionate advocate for it? Um, coincidence, an accident, a mistake. I'm I'm not really sure how to how to describe it. Um, the actual, the catalyst, so I'd been a frustrated person with lots to say and, and no outlet, no avenue to say it for quite a long time. And the actual catalyst, funnily enough, was my cousin posted on Facebook, and this is, you know, relatively early on in the days of Facebook, a casting call run by the ABC of all people. It's ironic that the ABC got me started um, for an Andrew Denton project called Project Next, which I believe ultimately became Angry Beast once it oh, actually yeah, so became a, a real show. thing. Yeah, and what he was looking for at the time, according to the casting call, was for this project called Project Next, and he was looking for the next generation of communicators and and journalists and and so forth, citizen journalism and that sort of thing. And and so I thought, well, you know what, I've got a lot to say, but I was already aware by that point in time of just how ideologically driven the ABC was, and I didn't want to be a part of something if I wasn't going to be allowed to actually speak my mind. So I made the decision in advance. I was going to make a video because that's how you had to audition. You had to make a video as an audition piece. I was going to make a video, but I was going to make a video that they were not going to like. That if this show was just another ABC ideologically driven show, then they were never going to cast me because they were never going to like what they saw. So I made my very first unpopular view video. And, uh, and that was unpopular view number one, all about the, the Melbourne water crisis and in particular the desalination plant as compared to building a dam on the Mitchell River. Now, of course, the ABC, being very Greens driven, are very anti-damming any new rivers. They don't want to make any new dams. So here I was in this video saying, hey, we need to make another dam. Well, unsurprisingly, I was never shortlisted for Andrew Denton's uh, Angry Beast. Now, that may or may not be because of the content, or it might just be because they looked at it and went, actually, you're pretty crap at what you do. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna claim that that was somehow an ide ideologically driven decision, but I will say that I wasn't surprised. Um, and so I just put it up on YouTube. I, I just took the video that I'd made as an audition piece for Andrew Denton's um, Project Next and I put it up on YouTube and, and really didn't think a lot about it. And it, it sort of frittered along at sort of 30, 40 views and then it slowly found its way to 100 views and then I got up in the morning and all of a sudden it was at 400 views and I tried to figure out why and I eventually discovered that somehow someone had seen it and had forwarded it on to Andrew Bolt and he'd liked it and he'd put it up on his blog and then all of a sudden the, the views started to go through the roof from there. 
Then I started to get phone calls and emails. And to this day, I do not know how some of these people got my contact details because they weren't in the video. Um, but people started to get in touch with me saying, hey, can you tackle this other subject over here? And I had someone who wanted to tackle, wanted me to deal with a, a particular road bypass that was being built down on the Mornington Peninsula, which I knew nothing about and, and never did a video on because I, I didn't know anything about it. Um, but eventually I got a phone call from someone who had another water related topic. Uh, and it was something that I did know a little bit about. And it was something that I could get behind. And that became the, the second video, which is all about the North-South pipeline the water pipeline that was supposed to go, or actually it has been built, so it goes between the irrigation districts of the Murray River down into Melbourne. And um, and so I made my second video, and that's kind of where it actually became a thing. Before that, it was just a one-off. It was an audition piece, but it was that second video that kind of turned it into a thing. Um, and I've kind of followed my nose ever since. I think people, people think that I know what I'm doing far more than I actually do. I've kind of fumbled and stumbled my way through this whole thing. Um, every series that I've ever done has often just been the result of, of a late night um, conversation, potentially with or without a bottle of wine with someone where I've just gone, hey, that sounds like a great idea. Let's do that. Uh, there's no grand plan. There's no strategy that I'm working to. I just when I get fired up about something and I need an outlet and I need I need to be able to get whatever it is inside out of me. That usually is the catalyst for me to make another video. Oh, that's certainly not a bad, a bad philosophy to have. I mean, uh, I know a lot of <laughs> successful YouTubers who have uh, done exactly that. I, I thought that yeah. you talked about your Hungry Beast uh, audition video. I watched quite a few episodes of those, mm. that show, um, and, and I was guilty of watching it for the sole reason to get outraged. Um, but yeah, I thought you would have been... <laughs> I thought you would have been a great talent to, to have on that show, and yeah, so as uh, well, thank you. And the, yeah, there's still people who claim that the ABC is not biased. Your YouTube channel, it's been up for what nearly se uh, seven, eight years. Um, you've, uh, as years, I mentioned, yeah. that you've produced a number of uh, libertarian web series. Um, in your view, like over that time, I mean, your videos have lots of comments on them. Uh, in your view, what, mm. uh, in terms of uh, liberty education or educational video, uh, what, what appears to work and what doesn't when it comes to communicating liberty? Ooh, like I said, I, I didn't set out with a plan. Um, and the, the upside of that in answering that question is that it means that I've actually evolved my style and what I do quite a lot. Um, it's interesting when I do talk to people who have followed me since the early days, it's really educational for me to get a bit of a window into how I'm perceived from the outside from, by others. Obviously, we all live inside our own skin and it's hard to hard to see ourselves and to see what we do from, from a different perspective. It's really interesting to talk to people who are like, oh, I love the fact that you're still the same. And I think that's interesting because I would actually say that my style has changed radically. For better or worse, it's up to other people to decide. But I think I've changed radically over the years. And, and here's what's changed. When I started, my objective was, was two things. When someone watched one of my videos, I wanted it to be thought provoking. I didn't, I didn't just want to be polemic and, and just preaching to the converted. I wanted to be able to meet people with wherever they were at and bring them to my conclusion and bring them to the point where by the end of the video, they agreed with me, not because I had berated them into agreeing with me, but because I'd presented reason and, and an argument and some humor and had won them over to arrive at my conclusion. Whereas now I see myself very much at the opposite end of the journey. I don't see myself helping people to reach conclusions. I see myself as trying to get people to ask questions. And the analogy that I use is this. If, if you think about, if you think of a person ideologically, often most of us and myself included for many years until eventually I started to learn and started to shift, we're very attached to our position. And it's often not logical, it's not, it's not a matter of reason, it's a matter of emotion. We are very strongly attached emotionally, and, um, attached to our position emotionally. And getting someone to make that initial movement, to break away from that emotional attachment, the analogy that I give is it's like collecting mussels or, or um, oysters, whatever, the ones that attach themselves to piers and, and to rocks and that sort of thing. Now you can go out to a remote location and find lots of them and break them off the rocks and put them in a bucket and put them in the back of the car and drive them home. 
the hardest part of that journey, it might be a hundred kilometer journey all the way back to your house where you're going to cook them and eat them. But the hardest part of that journey was the bit where you had to break them off the rock. It was that initial getting them to shift, getting them to give way from that position that they had held and had become attached to. That's kind of where I see myself today. I'm not, I'm certainly not the most intelligent person in the liberty movement. Uh, and I am not the kind of person you would want to come to, I guess, as a, as a sensei, as a teacher. Uh, what should I believe? I am not your guy, all right? Um, there are other people far better equipped, far better educated in the liberty movement who do some incredible work. Most of it, unfortunately, is a little bit more on the academic side and not very consumable for a disinterested public. So my job, as I see it, is to get people to break away from their current position and to ask to, to be willing to consider the possibility that maybe they're wrong. And hopefully from there, we can get them to find some of this other content and other material that is made by other people who are far better equipped than I am to, to expound on the, whether it be the market or whether it be ideas of liberty or, or what have you. Um, and hopefully it's that journey that leads them on to a conclusion that I would agree with, but I'm no longer trying to take them there. I'm simply trying to get people to consider seriously the possibility, in many cases, for the very first time in their lives, the possibility that they might have to change their views. And if I can achieve that, just that initial crack to separate them from their current position, uh, then I've, I've achieved what I've set out to do. Because uh, it's certainly a hard task to get people to basically uh, rethink, change everything they've believed in in one go and it's interesting that you told that story because with your most recent uh video series lifestyle regulation madness it's it's they're very short sharp and to the point and it's getting people to think well for all these rules that they really really helping us where i noticed with your uh pre previous videos they're more longer philosophical uh videos mm -hmm. where you are trying mm -hmm. to get people in one go yeah, and, and that's what I realized. The, the long form won me a small number of hardcore fans who generally, for the most part, were people who already agreed with me before they watched the video, which means that I wasn't achieving my goal of changing people's minds. It's what I was trying to do, but I wasn't achieving it because no one who disagreed with me was sticking around and watching for long enough to be influenced. Whereas with these shorter, sharper kind of, and, and I'm, I'm trying to use a lot more um, these days, I'm trying to use just a lot more absurdity. And with the Lifestyle Regulation Madness series in particular, essentially just mocking all of these, the overregulation, all of the rules. And if I can just get my audience member to say, yeah, that's ridiculous. That is, that is so stupid. That's all I need to do with them. I don't need to walk them all the way to the point where they agree with me ideologically or they're going to vote for a different political party or anything like that. I just need to get them to recognize that the status quo is not okay. And that is pretty much all I am actually setting out to do with all my videos today. Now, uh, at the Friedman Conference every year, which uh, we've both attended, and you're actually mm. a speaker, you gave a I have uh, been, yeah. uh, interesting presentation on homeschooling, which we did a, a previous podcast on. There's mm. always a session at the Friedman Conference every year on liberty education, communicating mm. liberty, yet it's clear we, we still have a long way to go. And like when I hear these sessions, yeah. I always feel, I feel a bit downtrodden that you know we discuss this every year yet uh, we don't seem to have made much progress so well, what do you think how, how do you think we can improve well there's a couple of things that are encouraging to me firstly i think there are a lot more people today who are trying to communicate libertarian ideas than there were eight years ago when i started um uh, it would be, I would be overstating the case to say that I was the only one doing it in video eight years ago in Australia. I wasn't quite the only one, but I was close to it. Today, there's heaps of different channels. And, and what's wonderful about that is each different channel, each different presenter, each person has their own style. They attract their own audience. They, they have their own particular messages and their own particular subjects that they emphasize. And each sort of each of us in our own way, in our own little niche and corner is doing our own thing. Uh, it's, it is kind of the free market at work. It's the, the, the free market of, of ideas at work as different people get involved. Um, I think what's really important is if you want to be a communicator, we often focus very much on what am I saying? What's my message? But actually that's the third thing that you need to think about. It's not the first or even the second. The first thing you need to think about 
is who are my audience? Who am I actually talking to? The second thing you need to think about is where are they at right now? Only once you properly understand both of those things is it worth you even thinking about what you want to say. Because you, whatever it is that you want to say, you need to do it in a way that is appropriate to your audience and where they're at right now. And what that kind of means, if, if when I talk to people who are getting started with different um, podcasts or different ideas, and I always ask them, okay, so who is this podcast for? Who is this video series for? And if they say to me, oh, it's for everybody, that to me is an alarm bell straight away because nothing is for everybody. If you're saying it's for everyone, you're saying it's for no one. You need to pick your audience. And this I'm not saying this to you. I'm saying this to anyone who wants to be a communicator in any area, let alone in political ideas. You need to pick your audience. Who is it that is going to identify and resonate with you? And where are they at right now? Now, think about what it is that you want to say and how you make it appropriate to that audience. And that's not, in, not only what you say, it's also how you do it. Uh, do you do it as a talking head? Do you do it as interviews? Do you do it in animation and funny voices? That all depends on who you're talking to and where they're at and what you're trying to say. Um, so tailoring all of that to say, this is my audience. And if other people also watch, great. But I'm going to make what I am making for this audience. And if I can reach out to them, then tick, I have achieved what I set out to do. Don't try and be viewed by you know, millions, billions of people. Well, don't try and compete with the number of, of you know, Instagram followers that, that the Kardashians have. Don't think that that's possible. It's not. And by, by aiming for that, you're undermining your ability to communicate with a particular segment. I know who my audience are. I know who I know who resonates most strongly with me, uh, and I reach out to them and I, I target what I say and what I do, and I think about the topics that I'm talking about not only in terms of what interests me, but also in terms of who they are, where they're at, and what would interest them. Uh, and so I have a small but very loyal and and really wonderful group of of fans and followers. <coughs> who reliably show up to watch my videos and to comment on my Facebook posts and, and to debate things and to question me when they, when they feel that I'm wrong or to bring in new information and extra evidence where they feel that I haven't properly accounted for a subject. Um, because I, I, I figured out fairly early on who it was that was going to connect with me and who it was that I needed to be talking to. So that would be my advice. If you want to communicate liberty, think about what you want to say third. Think about who you're talking to. Think about where they are at and then think about how you can tailor what you want to say to suit that audience. Yeah, that's definitely true. I think understanding your audience is the key and understanding what position they may have initially mm. and how mm -hmm. you're going to work to getting from, because you've got to have, I think, in my view, an appreciation for where people are currently at. So I understand your, your problems here, here and here. This is why exactly. you should uh, adopt my position if, if this is the, the outcome that you want. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And it's it's that's going to be different for you than what it is for me than what it is for any of the other communicators. And, and that's why I'm really excited by just the sheer number of people who have started communicating now, because it allows me to segment and to say, you know what, I'm just going to speak to my audience. I don't have to worry about all the people that I'm missing because someone else is going to get them. Someone else is going to pick them up. And, and each different series that I've done has had its own audience. It's been aimed in a, in a slightly different way. Uh, the pub test is aimed at a different audience again. <clears throat> and then what you do is aimed at a different audience. And, and each of the, of the communicators that are coming out of the woodwork and, and have done over the last few years, it's really exciting to see. Uh, and I, yeah, I think there's really good times ahead. I think, I think between all of us, we're going to influence a lot of people. And no one of us will be able to claim credit. But between all of us, we will have actually made a pretty big difference. Yeah, definitely. And we have libertarians, we are facing uh, uh, ch challenges at the moment. I mean, obviously, uh, protectionism is making a mm. comeback both on the left mm -hmm. and the right of politics. And also identity politics is affecting mm. not just the left, but also the right as well. And so we've mm. got to basically rethink, you know, how we're, we're going to you know, spread our message in, the, in this new sort of paradigm. Yeah, and, and it, it can be easy to get discouraged, I guess. Um, it can be it can be hard to stay motivated when you feel like you're always on the defensive. And my advice to anyone who feels 
tired or feels like they're always on the defensive is, okay, stop being on the defensive. Let's actually get back on the front foot. And what that means, you know, I, I, I love hearing, I don't love it, I hate it, but that's, <laughs> that's me being euphemistic. I love hearing from people we just should, we should do, make this reform, this change, this whatever it is, once and for all, as though in their mind, once they get what they want, that's the end of the argument. If we allow that to happen, either those people or another group of people immediately set a new agenda that is even further on. It's that slippery slope argument that we get mocked for all the time, but it, it is actually true in reality. It may not be the same people that argue for each step on the slope. It might be different people each time. But every time you take another step down a slope, there is someone else ready to argue for why, you know, culturally, politically, whatever, we should take the next step down that slope. So don't allow things to be done once and for all. Question them, challenge them, force them to defend the ground that they have already claimed rather than saying, oh, well, that's been written into law or, or this is a lost cause and then allow them to set the agenda on the next one. An interesting example of that, <clears throat> well, for me, very much was the carbon tax and what happened with the 50 to 1 project. The 50 to 1 project was just one small part of a much bigger landscape of, of people, communicators, some politicians, um, you know, educators, a lot of academics who really got on the front foot and said, hey, this carbon tax thing, this is nuts. Even if you do believe in the, the, the anthropogenic global warming narrative, even if you do accept everything that the IPCC claim, it's nuts. The, this sacrifice that we're making is going to make zero detectable difference to the temperature. I heard people at the time being quite fatalistic and being quite, oh, well, it's been done now. It's, it's the law. What can we do about it? And they were ready to concede that step. And had they done so, someone else would have set the next step. Oh, we've got to get all cars off our road, all, all non-electric cars off our roads by the year whatever. We've got to have 100% renewable energy by the year whatever, which they are still very much trying to do, but far more slowly than what would have happened. <coughs> because what happened in reality was a, a bunch of us independently, we didn't get together and do it. There's no vast right-wing conspiracy. <coughs> it's just a bunch of individuals who get fired up about things and make their own effort to make a change. And the 50 to 1 project was just one small part of that. But we won. We won that. The carbon tax was was destroyed. It destroyed the careers of the politicians that pushed for it. Uh, and, and we still, to this day, have no carbon tax. And so that's, that's a classic example where it would be very easy for people to say, oh, we keep losing ground. Well, no, we don't keep losing ground. Sometimes when we actually dig our heels in hard enough, we're able to stop something and the funny thing is, with, with a lot of these progressive agendas, when they lose, they eat each other. It destroys the careers of the people who are pushing for the reforms. We end up, the, the infighting comes out, the claws come out. It is very easy, just like those on the left like to believe that there's a vast right-wing conspiracy and that somehow people like me and other commentators and communicators, are all we're all getting together in, in dingy dive bars, you know, planning our next vast right-wing conspiracy moves. It can be easy for us to think the same thing of progressives and to think that they're a united singular front all pushing for the same thing. Actually, they are an incredibly fractured group of people with enormous amounts of internal conflict. And when we do dig in our heels and we win a fight, <coughs> the collateral damage on, the, on that side, on the progressive side of politics, um, can be really, really hilarious and, and quite a lot of fun to watch. So I certainly enjoyed watching the fallout from... Uh, the carbon tax and all of what happened uh, around that. And again, just to be clear, I'm not claiming credit for that with the 50 to 1 project. It was just one small part of, of you know, I was just one small voice among many, many voices. Uh, but nevertheless, I, I had the fun of playing a small part in uh, in changing what happened there and changing the outcome. So, and, and there are other examples that I could give. <coughs> but I think the message really is, it is worth fighting. It is worth digging your heels in. Um, Victories are possible. They seem few and far between at the moment. But I suspect that we are looking at, right now, we are looking at a period of history that will kind of be regarded as peak progressivism. Um, the demographic shifts, dem demographics cannot be defied. Uh, if, if, you know, you've heard me talk about this, Tim, at the conferences and so forth, where we, we get so caught up in politics, but actually politics is downstream of culture. 
And what's happening culturally in people's attitudes, what's happening in the entertainment industry, what's happening in this part of our lives influences quite strongly what we will or won't go along with politically. So, so politics is downstream of culture. And if culture has already shifted, a political shift is all but inevitable. But culture is downstream of demographics. And if we have a younger generation, if, if, if the millennials, if I'm right, and the millennials are by and large much more willing to live and let live, then I think as they start to come into voting age, uh, which we, we're just about to see start happening, I think we're going to see a significant return to more classical liberal ideas. Now, it's not going to be overnight. It's not going to be instantaneous. There's going to be many more battles to be fought. But I think we are actually looking at a, at a period of time that may well be reflected on as peak progressivism. We've seen shades of some of the pushback. And unfortunately, a lot of the pushback is, is currently taking the form of nationalism, which is not a good thing, in my view. Uh, but we are seeing pushback where people are sick and tired of the progressive agenda. We see that in Brexit. We see that in Trump. We saw that in, in the failure to keep the carbon tax here in Australia. Um, you know, we are we are seeing the the collapse of the anthropogenic global warming um, narrative. It's happening slowly. It's happening far more slowly than I would like it to happen, but it is happening. And I think, think that this is going to mark something of a high watermark for the progressive agenda. Now, not that I want to rest on my laurels or, or just assume that that's going to happen. So there's no need to keep on doing what I'm doing and to keep communicating and to keep trying to influence people. But I think there are very good reasons for hope and there are very good reasons for us to keep fighting and keep digging our heels in because I think the reinforcements are on their way uh, in the form of the, the millennials and that live and let live attitude. Uh, I'm glad you talked about uh, one of the successes that you've had um, because, yeah, we care. Libertarians can often be uh, quite pessimistic. But, yes, the, the carbon tax at, at the time, a lot of people were saying, you know, you can't fight, you know, progress, the science is settled, but it's a, it's a battle that we won. And now uh, not only yeah. uh, did the carbon tax go, but people are also questioning the renewable energy target and the, the climate science itself. And we've obviously seen one of the good things that Trump has done is uh, basically liberalise the, the US energy market. So there's progress on that front. Yes. Yes, walking away from the Paris Accord and all of that, all of that stuff, history will be very kind on him for doing. Uh, I'm, for me personally, the jury is out on Trump. There, is, there are elements of him that I like, but there's a lot of things about what he does, the protectionism. Uh, he, he's very much against the free movement of people, very much against the free move, movement of goods. Uh, there's a lot of, you know, uh, his military record is yet to be created, uh, but I have sneaking suspicions that it won't be particularly flattering to him. There's a lot of things about him that I'm not a fan of. Um, but certainly what he's done with regard to the energy markets in, in the US, what he's doing with regard to a deregulation agenda, um, is is a really good step in the right direction. And as much as you know, there are people making the argument that it's small fry, the amount of regulations that he's getting rid of is very small compared to the amount that have been written or, or compared to the amount that exist. And I say, yes, that's true. But let's be thankful for small mercies. For the first time in living memory, we have a, a US president who is actively lowering taxes and actively cutting regulation uh, and could not give a rat's what the media say about him is just not at all sensitive to the usual levers of power that get exercised over people in his position uh you know australian prime ministers and so forth the the media are used to being able to hold them hostage they're used to being able to dictate what goes on the agenda by deciding what's going to be in the headlines and what's going to be in that 24-hour news cycle and and one of the things that i enjoy about trump um, is how much he really upsets them because he refuses to obey their their agenda when it comes to what's going to be in the news and what his talking points need to be. So consider me still very much a Trump skeptic, um, but there are certainly some things that I really like in what he's doing. And energy policy and climate change is certainly an area where I'm a big fan of what he's done so far. Yeah, you've certainly got to celebrate the, the small victories. Now, there's one battle yeah, which yeah. Uh, I can't understand that we, we haven't won in this is obviously the nanny state. I mean, Australian governments, they never cease to mm. amaze us with their paternalistic policies. Why, why do you think the mm. Australian people tolerate this, like given that we are seen as laid back and, you know, we are, we are out there making the case that, you know, look how ludicrous these uh, nanny state regulations are? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I got asked exactly this question in an interview on, on American radio when I was over there last uh, two years ago. And why is it that the reality of Australia is so different from the perception? And And my argument or my response was, I think the perception was never correct. I don't think we have ever been the people that we tell ourselves that we are in terms of standing up to authority and being being the disobedient uh, ones who refuse to be ruled. No, that's that's actually never been us. We're, we're convicts at heart. Um, we, we come from a convict background. Our, our sort of social narrative is one of being oppressed and being downtrodden by an oppressive government that ultimately wins that ultimately get, gets what they want. We don't have a revolution story in our cultural nar narrative. The closest we get is the Eureka Stockade, and even that is not taught very well in schools. Um, it's taught as being a, a very narrow rebellion, uh, when actually it was a, quite a broad-based rebellion against bigger issues than just the uh, the mining licenses. That was the catalyst, but it was a, it was a bigger issue than that. Um, and so even what little heritage we have is kind of taken off us because the education system doesn't doesn't teach it. So I don't think that Australians need to rediscover their roots in order to find the will to push back against the nanny state. I think that's a that's a myth. I think we are having to find our backbone for the first time. I think it's actually, I you know, forget Republican versus versus monarchist debates about growing up as a nation. We just need to throw off the idea that we should be ruled by a nanny state for the first time in our history. We just need to throw that idea off. Whatever form that government takes, it should not have the right to micromanage our lives the way that it currently does. Uh, so I, I, yeah, I disagree with this idea of the, the carefree Larrick and Aussie. Well, carefree maybe. Um, but, you know, Larrikin may be down at the pub, carefree down at the beach, sure. But when push comes to shove and someone with a uniform and a badge comes and tells us what to do, we have a long history of saying yes, sir, no, sir, and falling into line. And that's what needs to change. We need to find the will to be civilly disobedient. We need to find the will to fight the small issues and to make a big noise over little things where culturally we're much more inclined to go along to get along. We're much more inclined to go, oh, well, what can you do? It's the government. You know, you'll never win. These sorts of cultural narratives are very deeply ingrained in, in our culture, and I think it comes from our, our convict background, uh, and we need to change that. And like I said before, I'm quite optimistic because I think we have a generation coming through um, that, for better or for worse, don't like being told what to do. And unlike the reactionary generations of the 60s and 70s, where, sure, they didn't like being told what to do by conservatives, but they were more than willing to tell other people what to do as soon as they got their hands on the levers of power. And that's what we're seeing today, you know, 30, 40 years later. Uh, this generation coming through now, I think, not only do they not want to be told what to do, they also don't want to have to tell someone else what to do. And I, I think that is what gives me a lot more, <clears throat> a lot more hope and a lot more heart with what's happening today. Because I still see there's still plenty of smokers out there. There's certainly plenty of drinkers, yet they still happily, you know, pay the, the taxes when they buy the products, you know, every year when the government... But was that you said there was pl plenty of drinkers, you said? Was that was that what you said? Yeah. Yes. The, the people who are watching the, uh, watching this on uh, YouTube will notice that you're uh, drinking, which brings mm -hmm. that, is a good segue into the ne uh, next topic which is discussing your uh, latest uh, web series which is a show called The Pub Test which has uh, had four yes. episodes so far it's already got uh, over a thousand followers on Facebook it features you and three other uh, guests discussing the week's events over the drink uh, over a drink now I should um, clarify the meaning of what the term pub test means it's it's an Australian yeah. political term uh, which uh, uh, it refers to if a politician makes a policy announcement or proposes a certain course of action, the media asks, does it pass the, the pub test, which is the premise of your show, that mm. is what government's doing, what's in the news, does it pass the, the pub test. So what's your goal with uh, this series? Yeah, well, I should talk a little bit about what it is and, and clarify. Um, so it's actually a partnership between myself and two others, Will and Rachel, who you'll see on the show very regularly. And uh, and so it's it's us as a trio and then one guest every week. But the nature of our lives for myself, Will and Rachel is that we, we travel a lot. We're away a lot. And so 
the idea behind it being a trio was that hopefully in any given week, two of us will be available and then we'll bring on two guests. And if all three of us happen to be in Melbourne at the time, then great. It'll be the three of us plus a guest. The, the idea with the pub test, there's a couple of things going on there. Firstly, going back to what I said earlier about just trying to get people to question where they currently are and question what they currently believe. And by having a, a show that voices what a lot of people are thinking, but they're afraid to say, and by them not saying it, they're invalidating their own opinion. And so they stay stuck where they are and they think they should be over there. They think actually there's some truth over here, but no one's saying that. Maybe it's just me thinking it, so I'm going to stay safe where I am, where I'm not going to be criticised. And and it's the show that's designed to help people to just break loose that little tiny bit from from their current thinking. And it's a real pushback against the likes of The Project and Q&A and, and a lot of other shows in the Australian media, media landscape where they are pretty much universally, predictably left-wing. You, you can name any topic you like. You can pretty much predict what the overall tone of the panel is going to be. In in a show like Q&A, people who, who dissent from the prevailing view are brought on only for the purpose of mocking, for the purpose of shouting over, for the, for the purpose of trying to make them seem silly. Uh, the audience is stacked. I don't care what they say uh, about that. I don't care how much they protest that. No, they do the surveys and they make sure the audience is representative. No, it's not. You just need to listen to their responses and realise how out of touch that is with what we see when the Australian public do actually go to the polls to realise that these people are seriously out of touch with, with mainstream Australia. But because these shows have created an echo chamber for themselves, they, they are completely unaware of where they are actually in, in the spectrum. Uh, and I know for a fact that the presenters of these shows, uh, because many of them are on record, uh, tell themselves and believe themselves to be <coughs> very much in the centre when when that's patently not the case. So this is really a response to that. And someone someone much wiser and more experienced than me once, um, once in, in jest, but in seriousness at the same time, thanked all of the left-wing journalists for their success. They are more of a, a more of a conservative journalist, and and they thanked all of the the left-wing journalists for for their success, saying, "I have no right to be uh, incredibly successful as I am. Uh, my talent isn't what's caused me to be so successful. What's caused me to be so successful is that everyone else is over there competing for that audience, and I was left with all of this, with half of the Australian public all to myself, with no one else competing for their eyeballs and competing for their time. And I think there's a little bit of that going on with the pub test, where people are are seeing it and hearing it, and it feels refreshing. It feels like people are, you know, the sorts of responses that we're getting, people are saying, oh, thank God, finally, someone is talking some common sense. And it's not that the show is amazing. It's that we're actually willing to say what so many other shows have decided they're not going to say. And as a result, a lot of people are, are really resonating with that. And, and we're, we're picking up audience very, very quickly, which is which is really nice. But we're not here to, like, this is not a, it's not a libertarian show. We're not here to talk about, you know, Mises and Ayn Rand and economic theory and the, you know, the invisible hand and blah, blah, blah. We're just talking about topical new stuff. What's been going on in the news? What's going on in politics? And how can we poke fun at that? How can we have a bit of a laugh and have a bit of fun and ha help the viewer to, to have that moment where they go, yeah, that's ridiculous. That is ridiculous. And again, it's just that, just to have that moment of crack coming away from the position where they currently are because once they're free of that they could move a very long distance in a very short space of time but if, if we can just get them to to have a laugh at their own stupidity because 15 minutes ago they agreed with what was announced and now as they listen to us having a laugh and mocking it they go oh actually that is ridiculous crack they're free and they're going to start thinking for themselves in ways they maybe wouldn't have had they not come across a show like that so for us i think that's that's really what it's about uh, but the other thing is as well, I just wanted an excuse to go down the pub and have a drink with my mates and, and have a bit of a laugh. And um, if I can turn that, if I can turn my social life into some good media content, then then great. Uh, and it'd be quite interesting if you did an election night coverage where you were going for three <laughs> or four hours. Like, uh, how many drink, <laughs> drinks would you get through? Oh, goodness, goodness me. Well, it's been quite interesting. It turns out that I'm always the one who's reached the end of my pint by the end of the episode. And the episode in real life, it takes about 40 minutes to film. 
and we edit that down to sort of five segments that might total 25, 30 minutes. <clears throat> so I finish my pint usually in about 40 minutes and um, everyone else is only sort of two thirds of the way through theirs. So roll that out over four or five hours of election night coverage and, um, and things really could get interesting. I've never, uh, as the expression goes, drunken broadcasts. <laughs> That's not something that I do. <laughs> but they have lasted no. longer than the, the previous uh, uh, alcohol uh, web series, which was the, the Cooper's Keeping It Light uh, series. That obviously didn't, oh. didn't turn out very well. And, and what a perfect example of the kind of intolerance that is inherent to so much progressive politics now. Uh, I, I know Tim. Um, <clears throat> I haven't met Andrew, but I, I hope I get to someday. Um, but in fact, Tim uh, has been invited on to uh, the pub test, and, and obviously he's a busy man. He's a senator now, and, and we completely respect the pressures on his time, but we hope sooner or later we, we, we hope to be able to have him on, on the show and, and have a beer with him and have a bit of fun. Um, but the, the sheer intolerance, the anger, the spite that was hurled at that, that show because they dared to give oxygen to Andrew Hastie. They dared to give oxygen to someone who didn't toe the strictly orthodox, as they would like it to be, line on, on the definition of marriage was really extraordinary. And this, I think, is what the millennials are reacting to now. I, I think that they are able to see the hypocrisy of this to a degree that so many Gen Xs and even to a limited degree Gen Y just can't. Um, Gen X really drove a lot of this stuff. They, they're the ones driving a lot of this hypocrisy and they can't see it. But but your millennials, the, the new taboo, the new, um, you know, being edgy soon is going to mean pushing back against political correctness. It's, it's actually going to be... You know, this is this is an interesting thing, and it comes back to sort of cultural studies and so forth, which I haven't done, and I have no intention of doing. But as you as you look at it, culture, begets counterculture. <clears throat> as soon as a culture becomes a prevailing culture, it becomes cool to rebel against that culture, and that's why we see this pendulum kind of effect, where where culture is not a static thing; it never has been throughout history. It's always evolving and always changing. And that's because each new generation looks for its own identity and often finds that identity in rebelling against what it was given. For better or for worse, that just seems to be the way it works. And I think what we are seeing is the pendulum has reached its, its, <coughs> its maximum in the progressive direction, at least for the time being. And we're about to see a, a generation of people who find pleasure, who, who find it's the, the forbidden for them is to say, hey, you do you, I'll do me, and how about we don't tell each other how to live? And that's actually almost becoming a cool thing for the younger generation. Uh, and I, I think the Coopers keeping it light thing was just a perfect example where so many people outside of that echo chamber were just rolling their eyes, regardless of what how they saw the, 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 the marriage debate, regardless of what their position on the definition of marriage actually is, they were watching the reaction to a civil conversation about something that is topical, it's currently being debated politically, and to, to, to top it all off, this is a bit that blows my mind, the person they were reacting against was simply maintaining what is currently described in Australian law. And so many people are just rolling their eyes at the overreaction to that. And I think they're digging their own grave by creating these fake outrages. They're digging their own grave. Companies like Coopers, they will fold. They have too much at stake. Uh, they don't like the attention. They can't even handle the five minutes of fame. They, they, they're not going to sit there for 24 hours and wait for the news cycle to move on, which it inevitably will. And if they had just stayed the course and left it alone, you know, a maximum of 36 hours later, some other scandal would have come up and they would have been completely forgotten. But they folded, as a lot of these corporates do, <coughs> uh, which unfortunately then just fuels these sorts of reactions. They go, oh, well, we won that one. We, we got Coopers to, to, to capitulate. So we'll make a big fuss the next time someone does it. So it's a self-fueling cycle, but I can't help but think that it's reaching the end of its usefulness as more and more people are getting wise to the tactic and more and more people, frankly, are just getting sick of it. Absolutely sick of it. And it's just going to stop working soon. 
Yeah, and it's certainly fueled by the media as well, who perpetuate these outrages. Going back to the, the pub test, obviously you mentioned there's no shortages of panel-type shows uh, on TV, but uh, as you said, they're all you know, very left-wing. Uh, even the you know, right-wing or conservative mm. ones, they tend to be just... So, uh, as you would say, cheerleader type shows for you know the right side of politics. There's no sort of, I, I guess, sort of you know cr uh, critical analysis or maybe you know what, what these politicians did uh, wasn't good. And uh, I definitely think that Q and A is mm. the worst worst type of example. And this is why the mainstream media is in so much trouble. Is like Q and A is like, are we all agree on this? And we all think like this. You know, this is what everybody should think. I can't believe nobody would ever disagree with us. Yeah. And and uh, there's kind of this three possible categories. There's your polemic kind of show that is preaching to the converted. There's your intellectual kind of show that is trying to be deeper and is trying to really get into the issues and, and be more influential and more thought provoking, but unfortunately isn't very accessible. And only people who have a real interest in the topic are actually going to stick around to watch a show like that. The pub test is trying to be a third kind of show, which is an accessible and light-hearted show. We're not trying to be deep. Yeah, there's. I mean, the discussion does go a little bit deeper sometimes. It depends on the topic. Um, you know, episode four is, is uploading to YouTube right now and, and we'll be on Facebook later tonight. And yeah, there's some disagreement on some things in there and we, we do end up inevitably going a little bit deeper. As soon as two people have different views on something, you end up going deeper into that subject. And that's, that's always fun and, and fascinating to me. But... Our main objective is actually just to get people in and to get people enjoying the show and for the first time in their life hearing some of these ideas. It's For us, we don't want to be that in-depth show. We don't want to be that polemic show that's preaching to the converted. We just want to be that first point of contact for people who might otherwise never have come across someone who identified as libertarian or had the view that the government should actually do less rather than more. That might be something that a lot of people never come across in their lives. And they don't have anyone in their life who holds that view. But if we can get them watching the pub test, then they end up making friends and getting to know people and starting to like these people on the screen who start to have these views that might actually start to influence their thinking. Yeah, I think, uh, from my own experience with the Unshackled, the best feedback you get is finally, you know, a, f a refreshing media organisation which, you know, finally, you know, speaks my language. And it, it, it not just, yeah. uh, as the expression goes, like, preaches to the converted, it, it makes other people think, well, you know, maybe I'm not the only one thinking this. Maybe, uh, you know, yeah. I should explore this a bit more, you know, maybe talk to some others about it as well. Yeah. And it makes people bolder. Uh, one of the objectives we have with the pub test is to be shareable. We want to be the kind of content that someone would watch and go, hey, you know who needs to watch this? My mate, such and such, and and share it on. We want, we want to equip people to be able to be bold with these views. And so often politics is taboo. It's that thing of, oh, you never talk about religion, money, or politics over a barbecue, you know, or over the dinner table. These are the taboo subjects. And we're kind of saying, well, hang on. You can talk about politics down at the pub, and we all do it anyway. We're all doing it all day long. But you can do that and you can have fun at the same time. And it's all right to share these ideas and these videos, these segments with uh, with mates that you think might be interested. And and just breaking down that taboo so that people can actually talk about this stuff is, is part of the agenda. That reminds me of the, the Toastmasters rule where you're not allowed to talk about sex, religion, or politics, which takes away yeah. all the, the juicy topics. Where's the fun? What have you got left? Oh, well, I, I've certainly enjoyed watching the, the pub tests uh, so far. So congratulations on yeah, four you. episodes in and already uh, building up a substantial following. And so thank you for coming on today's show and not just talking about pub tests, but also your uh, illustrious uh, vi uh, video career. Well, thank you so much for having me. It's, it's been a lot of fun and, and well done to yourself. I mean, you've built up quite a following and, and the Unshackled, it's, it's what we were saying before, you know, you've got your audience and your style and there are people who really resonate with you and what you're doing here um, who may never follow the pub test, some hopefully will, um, but, but we each speak to our audience and we each influence the people that we can reach and, and clearly what you're doing is resonating with people. So thank you for having me on and, and well done on what you're doing. Well, keep up the great work, Topher, and Thank you. I'm sure we'll run into each other at another Liberty event coming soon. Looking forward to it. Thanks, Tim.
All right, everybody, that's the show for today. So don't forget, if you haven't already signed up to the email list at theunshackled.net slash subscribe, please consider supporting the work on The Unshackled by becoming a patron on Patreon. Also, we have Unshackled merchandise for sale at uprightmarket.com. Also, don't forget to subscribe to this podcast. You can do so on SoundCloud, iTunes, Stitcher, TuneIn Radio, or view the video version on YouTube. And of course, don't forget to keep checking theunshackled.net on a regular basis. Thanks once again for listening, and we'll see you next time.